So essentially, I wish to thank uh, Sir for giving me such an opportunity uh, to talk about uh, dialysis and especially the alarms in dialysis. Most of the time, uh, we are doing a lot of good work. I must say our staff are working 24 hours without a rest. And this is not for acute patients. This is for chronic patients. Now, the, the type of patients we have as compared to the olden days is different. They are healthy. They are productive. And so it is up to us to give them a good service. It is their right to have good dialysis. Now, we know as compared to the uh, acute patients, the chronic patients are stable. So we are not expecting any problems unless uh, they volunteer. And most of them are happy when they come. They are happy to be in our unit. But one must always be ready that things can go wrong. And it is for this we have alarms in the dials machine. It's not moving. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about, I mean, it's just a general topic. I'll introduce you, uh, uh, talk about dialysis and the parts of the machine and the different alarms and the situations. As I said, this uh, uh, photograph, photographs are taken from the uh, patients who are undergoing dialysis. The way they are, some of them, I hate dialysis.com. So it just imagine living your life on a machine. If you're alive, uh, you do not know how many days and uh, things can happen within seconds or minutes. The important thing, what we have, these patients can come and sleep. How is it possible? It's just, it's possible just because of our health. We have monitors, the monitors maybe, Machines, the machine, now hemodialysis machine is also called, called as monitor and other devices. And we have our protocols. The most important part is the personnel. The personnel is the technician, the nurses, and the doctors that are available. We know hemodialysis apparatus it has two circuits, the blood circuit and the dialysis, dialysis circuit. Now you have to know it's very simple. We know that we, we are able to draw blood from the patient with, through the AD piston needle or the catheter. This is the blood goes to the blood circuit. And that goes, reaches the, there is an arterial pressure monitor, which you are not routinely using in our day-to-day -day practice. This is followed by the blood pump. And this is called the pre-arterial uh, pre pump of this segment where there is negative pressure. So this is one of the dangerous area where because of the negative pressure, uh, complications due to air embolism can occur. This is followed by the pump is followed by the post pump segment. And here you have the, uh, you have the IV line and you can also have the heparin infusion line. Here it is a positive situation. That means the blood pump, the function of the blood pump is to drive the blood into against the resistance offered by the dialyzer across all the uh, detectors and followed by reaching the patient. Even the venous reaching the fistula is not so easy because that also offers resistance. For this, we need a pump. So what you must always remember is this is the pre-pump segment, which is negative, followed by the rest of the segment is positive. And we have along the way, a pressure monitors and air detector and blood leak detectors. So the part of the tubing are, you must know that it has connectors both on the arterial and venous side, the dialysis connectors, the drip chamber or the bubble tap, and the heparin infusion line and the saline infusion line. So something about the blood pump, we casually connect the tube across the pump. We must realize that this pump plays an important role as well here. It is able to move the blood at a force with a, at a rate of about 200 to 
600 ml per minute. And it has been adjusted so that the two rollers slide over each other and does not cause force or compression on the tube. So how we load this on the circuit, on the pump is also important. So there's a spring loaded, it is spring loaded to prevent under or over occlusion of the blood tubing. And this will help to overcome certain resistance. You know, the resistance across the needle, catheter, tubing, and dialyzer. Over occlusion of the tube can cause rupture of the RBCs, and that condition is called hemolysis. If you don't properly uh, load it, what will happen is there can be some, the, some of the blood that you have pulled will go back, and that will also cause some amount of pulling in the air and the foaming of the blood. And also, in the law, after some time, it can also lead to hemolysis. So along the blood circuit, we have monitors that is measuring our arterial pressure, which is called the arterial pressure monitor, the venous pressure monitor, and we have the air foam detector, blood leak detector. But essentially, the blood leak detector is seen in the dialysate circuit. Now, what is this arterial pressure monitor measuring? It measures the amount of, it is actually set at a negative pressure. Because, you know, as I said earlier, it is a negative segment which is pulling because of the blood pump. So it is actually maintained below zero, maybe approximately minus 100 to, it can go to a range of 200. Always remember it is in the minus range. So it helps us to detect the pressure at the level of the artery. So it is supposed to be negative. And what happens is if it becomes positive, we know there is some block, there is some kink, or if it is becoming negative, uh, more, more negative than earlier uh, level, then either the needle has pulled off. So it helps to help you to detect whether the needle has been pulled off or not. But due to certain reasons, I think because of complications like uh, because of negative suction and being connected to the uh, pressure monitor, there is chance for infection if you don't properly take care and more chance for air embolism. But whatever it is, this sort of the uh, segment we are not using. Now, the venous pressure monitor, what does it measure? The venous pressure monitor is seen in the venous side of the circuit. This venous pressure actually uh, tells you the it gives you an idea of the pressure in the dialyzer compartment and the blood compartment. That means you're getting some idea of the transmembrane pressure or the TNP, as well as you have an idea as to what is happening at this, at this segment, whether there is a block or not, or whether there is also a decreased pressure or a raised pressure. We have, this is called the pre-pump arterial pressure monitor. And this is called the post-pump arterial pressure monitor. That is, it is seen just before the dialyzer. So what does it do? If there is rise in any pressure, that means if there is any clotting tendency, this may be the first monitor to detect. It. But that is also, we are not routinely using it. We have other additional alarms like the blood flow rate, the heparin infusion line, normal saline uh, infusion monitor. This is again just to show you what is really happening. This is called the P1 segment before the blood pump. The P2 segment, your P1 segment is negative, followed by a positive pressure, which becomes a little lesser because of the resistance across the circuit. And in this process, we know why am I stressing on this? Because it's transducer protected. The venous or the arterial pressure monitor is connected to the machine. This is actually the link between the machine and only link between the machine and the blood drip. That means between a wet site, it is a wet site, and it is converting the pressure, air pressure into an electronic signal. That is a mechanical uh, element is converted to an electronic signal, which we are able to interpret. So with this, we are able to monitor the venous pressure, arterial pressure, and indirectly the TMP. And what is important about this is make sure this area is always, the transducer is always dry. Otherwise, it can interfere with the measurement. And if not, 
if you are not using it properly, it may be a source of infection as well. Now coming to the dialysate circuit, what is happening? We have some are the treated RO water coming at a certain pressure and this goes along the heater. Here it, the water is being warmed. Why? Because one, we want the water, the temperature to be as same as almost the same as our body temperature. But to some extent, it also helps in diffusion as well. Diffusion of the dialysate, mixing of the dialysate as well. And to, this is followed by the temperature is normally set around 35 to 38 and followed by the deaeration pump. What is happening here is the heated water, out of a micro bubbles, bubbles will become bigger bubbles and through the vent it is let out. This helps in removing the air to some extent. This is followed by the proportioning, proportioning pump where we have mixing of the acid and the base concentrate where you in the ratio of 1 is to 1.83 to 34 water. And whatever is mixed, we have to know what is the electrons in it. Is it same as our body? We are Whatever we are trying is, we are trying to make it look appear. We have to have it as similar as our body content. The ions should be the same as, almost same as, or the osmolality should be the same as our blood, blood level. And this, the conductivity probe and the temperature probe are usually linked together. They help to measure the, so this is monitoring the temperature. And here, what the water, the, tree, the water goes to the dialysate compartment in the dialyzer. Now things can go wrong and the machine is able to detect it. If something happens with the conductivity, if something happens with the temperature, this, there is a bypass valve. That means the body, our human body is not exposed to abnormal levels of sodium or increased temperature. Otherwise other complications can occur. So. If everything is good, it goes through the next uh, tube where you have the blood leak. Next part, which you have the blood leak detector. Why are we having this? Because in the dialysate, if there has been any rupture of the dialysate membrane, the RBCs can come out and come to the dialysate compartment. And for this, we have the blood leak detector, essentially monitoring the blood, but it is seen in the dialysate circuit. And here is the dialysate pressure and the U of pump. This decides how much ultrafiltration is, is possible for our patient. And what is so uh, exciting is that once upon a time, all this had to be done manually. Now it's like smartphone. We don't have to worry. We just have to do the settings and everything is done automatically. So the fluid part of the dialysis, you have other monitors, though alarms may not be there at times, like the inlet pressure monitoring, the TMP monitoring, the blood leak detection, the pH measurement may not be used for, uh, may not be required for all the machines. So it is optional. So now this is our monitor. The monitor shows us everything. What are the, what uh, is required? It is seen in one display. The air detector is there, the blood leak, the arterial pressure, the venous pressure, and the TMP. And the goal that we set for ultrafiltration and you know the conductivity. So this is uh, taken from the b drawn machine. If you think there's something going wrong, you can actually see, open up this and immediately have a glance as to what is really happening. Now just see, here itself it's given battery is not fully charged. So it's not like the olden time, we didn't know what was actually happening in the machine. Everything is there for you. You have any doubt, you just have to look at these uh, and they will help you out. So this is how you be usually set. Suppose the patient is already into the dialysis or now there is the remaining time is only 53 minutes. This is the venous pressure and it is fine. We are happy with it and the, the arterial pressure and the TMP, everything is fine. And uh, we have already removed 2,310 ml of fluid. So, Alarm systems are there in the dialysate circuit alarm for essentially for conductivity and for temperature. So the blood circuit alarm, the air detector, the blood leak, the venous and arterial pressure and the transmembrane pressure is the alarm. Heparin and other infusion line disinfection, I'm not going to talk about. So coming to the blood circuit system, 
the alarms, what is so peculiar about the alarms in this is that there is something goes wrong, there is an audio, audible alarm, visual alarm, and the black one will stop. The Venus line will, the clamp, there's a, uh, I didn't mention that, there's a clamp in the Venus line that closes immediately. So you cannot reset, you cannot do it, the, it will not automatically reset, but it has to be done manually. Essentially, this is a patient-friendly function that occurs. That means nothing is going to happen to your patient. Everything is taken care of by the machine. Only thing, it is up to us to understand what has happened. In the dialysate circuit alarm also we have essentially for conductivity. It may be for high or low and temperature high or low. Some machines only give for high old and time. They used to give only for high temperature. And what is the response here? The blood circuit continues to operate. It will go on. We may get a light. We may see a light as to uh, what it may have that something has gone wrong, but the blood circuit will continue to operate and the dialysate fluid is bypassed around the dialyzer. Here, the system will reset automatically if the alarm condition, whatever has happened, if it corrects itself, it will automatically come back. And uh, I'm sure everyone knows this is the concentration we require at the end of the treatment for dialysis. So what happens? Conductivity, what, what is happening? It may be high or low. Why does it happen? Untreated incoming water, supply line, that is whatever the tube is not in the concentrate. The concentrate container is empty. The bicarbonate mixing was not done properly. The other things is in the long time, if you're not taking care of it, the clear may be clogged. The filter might have been closed uh, due to impurities. So the next, the last is the machine failure. If you look at all this, you know this is humanly possible. We can all prevent this to some extent. It is our duty to prevent this. So why do we have this conductivity? Just know that it's a measure of ions in the solution. It indicates an ability to transfer an electric charge and essentially it corresponds to the level of sodium. It is an indirect way. We cannot measure, keep measuring the uh, charges. So it's an indirect way and it corresponds to the sodium level in the dialysis. The greater the number of ions, the greater conductivity. So high and low conducting, conductivity is connected with high or low sodium level. It is easy to understand that. Now, proper mixing is required. Now, usually it is, uh, the range can be set to 12 to 16. But remember, what is our human uh, uh, sodium level? Maybe 134, 135 to 145. So what is required is we need the conductivity around that level. So essentially, we try to set at the normal sodium uh, level of that patient. It should be routinely checked. If you have doubt that this is something wrong, we can always, even if we don't have the tech, the engineer coming in, we can just check the dialysis sodium and see the level, whether the conductivity is okay or not. Otherwise, we have a conductivity meter. So the conductivity alarm is stimulated, the bypass, the bypass mode will be activated. And adjusting the conductivity limits during an alarm condition, you should never try to do that. If you adjust that, then overrides the bypass mode and what happens, the alarms will not be, will not get. So during dialysis, never, no intradialytic conductivity adjustment should be done. If it's not possible, if the conductivity is not improving, we have to shift the patient to another machine. Now, a question for everyone. A simple question. The patient, a regular patient coming for dialysis, his weight was uh, interdialytic weight gain is 2 kilos. Now, he has developed an episode of hypotension. What do you think is the level of conductivity in this patient? As I said, we try to set the conductivity almost as same as the patients. And if the conductivity has become low, 12, it can lead to hypotension. So that means this must have been something wrong with your mixing. You must try to find out what could have happened. Sometimes you find your patient suddenly vomits, uh, developing complications. So conductivity is designed as a concentration of sodium of a healthy human body set around 135 to 145. But remember, each individual is different. And uh, there's no single number that you should be aware of this. So if you have high conductivity, what can happen? 
if you just imagine you i know everyone knows about pickle you put an a uh, uh, mango in uh, uh, salted water what will happen it will sh shrink isn't it that is where how we get rbc's get cremated what happens to us humans we have we develop excess thirst just imagine after the dialysis the patient feels very thirsty and he's going to drink more water and it is also a cause for hypertension what happens if it's low conductivity the it causes low sodium and the low sodium can cause low blood pressure patient is suddenly developed cramps and in a, if you imagine a hypotonic dialysis it can lead to water intoxication can lead to cerebral edema can lead to at the uh, uh, cerebral edema or even non cardiogenic pulmonary edema in the process just imagine the rbc's are swelling up with water and we can develop, the patient can develop hemolysis so we don't want extremes of less or so what do you do what can you do first make sure that what you've done is correct the concentrate you've taken is correct or not or maybe you can change the concentrate make a new concentrate then see the concentrate is okay you've made a fresh one then whether it is being sucked if you just pull out the paper and see whether it's being sucked or not if if it's being sucked just see the alarm settings are correct if not if it's not being sucked you can reconnect and you try to maybe maybe there's some impurities blocking it or some air so you try to just flush it down or just heating it you may be able to open it up now if it's an old machine and the tubes are damaged you may have to replace it and after the maintenance whatever you have done and if you think the machine is started never don't forget to check the sodium the dialysis sodium has to be confirmed so correction is you correct the supply make sure everything is in place you show make sure that you have enough water coming and the concentrate is uh, uh, before starting dialysis make sure you keep the cans ready otherwise what i see is patient the dialysis may be started and after some time it comes as conductivity low that's because your container the concentrate the bicarb mixing and all was not done and they may be enough so just imagine nothing is going to happen to the patient but as i said earlier it is going to be going into the bypass mode so what if it goes there actually the patient is going to lose time on dialysis there may be some amount of fluid may be removed but the dialysis time is reduced so it is our responsibility to see that everything is ready when you start the before you start the dialysis and a uh, clock filter you may you i know uh, you can do cleaning and machine failure at the extreme this thing you may even have to change the machine the next alarm in the dialysis circuit is a temperature the temperature is very important it's always set by the uh, it's already set in by the uh, there's a set point in the machine and what happens sometimes we uh, we can do uh, the temperature profiling for a patient suppose a patient has got hypotension we try to decrease the temperature to 35 so that the blood pressure is maintained in um, for patients with hypotension and uh, what is the problem of having a high temperature just imagine our protein there will be hemolysis there can be protein denaturing that can be arrhythmia also cardiac irritation cardiac arrhythmia can occur what if the temperature is low the patient we may have shivering though in our uh, part it is not so common because we have a, a tropical temperature so uh, the shivering may be there increase in uh, cardiac irritability and we try at times we use this as a treatment modality but remember total dialysis time needs to be increased by 8% for every 3 degree below 37 because there is decrease in the diffusion with decrease in temperature it may be theoretical but then this is what is happening so uh, the ph we are not routinely monitoring certain machines will kind of start only if the ph is also within range so this is the importance of the bypass uh, valve activation but essentially what you must remember there is no um, alarm for this we do not know if it's really working properly or not but yes it comes the display is there that the it has gone into bypass mode so it, when when does it get activated whenever there is a normal uh, conductivity ph or something difference in the temperature now that was about the uh, dialysis circuit now what happens in the blood circuit 
as i said there are four monitors and the importance of the negative pressure and the positive pressure and the arterial pressure is usually less than zero and what happens when you get a negative arterial pressure just imagine a patient has hypotension whenever the patient is having low blood pressure suppose the needle you are putting is not properly positioned or the catheter is not properly placed there is a king or there is clotting something uh, wrong with the arterial axis uh, when you are doing a, a suction when you are taking uh, trying to increase the blood flow more than uh, possible there can be suction of the vessel wall maybe abnormal aa if is not no, uh, so something wrong with the av fistula then you are trying to pull blood with small bow needles the needle may be small uh, and you may not be able to get the amount of blood flow as required so you can take care of that uh, the blood, this is uh, usually taken care by how we are trying to increase we find out the cause for the drop in blood pressure we can change the position of the needle uh, we should not if, we, if the uh, blood flow has been suddenly increased you can decrease the blood flow and next time when you are using a, a, the needle the bore the, the gauge may be changed now the next alarm is the venous pressure alarm as i said the venous pressure alarm can either be low or high you can uh, indirectly monitor the post uh, uh, the segment after the uh, dialyzer and just uh, and also monitor the to some extent know the pressure in the axis the av fistula so what is happening is by high pressure that means there is some kink somewhere high pressure you are returning the blood to the patient so there may be some stenosis maybe your needle has not been properly placed maybe you punctured and then there is some hematoma formation maybe the uh, patient may be sleeping on the uh, on that side most of the time you find the routinely patients come on and sleep on that fistula hand without uh, being aware as to what is uh, whether the dialysis they are really happy to blissfully sleeping uh, deep in, in deep sleep so make sure whenever you the patient comes to you you are able to see the axis now what happens if it's reduce flow suddenly your setting how much a uh, setting will you do for a uh, setting will keep for a venous pressure it should be around 20 above the systolic pressure and the lower limit may be 10 mm below the systolic pressure so try to keep the uh, uh, do not keep the pressure as too much of a gap because what will happen is that when you keep uh, too much of uh, ex- pressure i mean the the me- machine may not sense it and you will be happy there is a, what i mean is if you give a pressure of 40 and if you give a pressure of 200 extremes of gap the pressure difference may not be detected easily and even if the needle comes out you may not be aware because there is some pressure in the uh, av fistula also that also uh, contributes to the pressure the venous pressure now if this is a question for you what do you see in this screen if anyone can answer what does this panel show you are seeing this venous pressure so what has happened to the venous pressure normally the venous pressure is set from 60 to 200 now the venous pressure has become low here the pressure the venous pressure is low the alarm will come as low venous pressure and the arterial pressure is all right so venous pressure is low so what is our first tendency maybe the first thing what will happen the alarm will there be an audible alarm visual alarm and uh, uh, of course Uh, it will not be of much of a problem maybe the dialysis may will be continued maybe it may will go into bypass but what happens venous pressure low limit and you just reset it and the dialysis will continue so what will happen the first thing you should always do is check the axis as i said if there is a wide gap in the venous pressure you may miss the if the needle has come out even so check the correct position of the needle is in is the blood flow too low maybe even low uh, the blood pressure is low you can have a low venous pressure check the tubing 
and if there is kink or anything, new links accordingly. So what is the problem I, I was trying to explain is that if there is uh, the venous pressure is, the gap has been set apart, widely apart, you may miss this. And if, even if the patient's needle is dislodged, you may not be aware and death can occur. So always make sure you are able to see the lines. You are able to see the access site. And if the first thing what you do when you see a low venous pressure is check the access site, whether the needle is in place. Sometimes there are other conditions that may lead to bleeding. You may miss it. The patient may be covering himself with the blanket or anything, and you may miss it. And so there are, these patients are by themselves uh, have tendency for increased bleeding because of over anticoagulation and, and the needle uh, removal of the needle or rupture of the vascular axis. Sometimes they can have an infected AV fistula uh, or dialysis membrane rupture. All these things are rare, but it can happen and loose. So one must be aware of such a condition that can be loose connections, line separation, and the bleeding may go unrecognized. And who, who's, see, already you know that these are routine regular patients coming off for regular dialysis. So it is, we are aware, we should be aware of the patient's condition. First thing, always try to communicate your patient to your patient. Talk to your patient. How was your day? How did how how did you do? How how did you do after your last dialysis? Were you fine? Did you have any problems? You know, while you're starting the dialysis, if you just talk to them, you can understand. Suddenly, yes, there is something. Something had. Uh, gone wrong, he will say he would have had vomiting, or he may say he would have taken excess fluid. So all this small, small information is very important. So who gets venous needle dislodgement? Who are at risk? Those who are old people, they may have some amount of uh, restlessness. And uh, if uh, sometimes in a difficult case of cannulation, remember even excessive hair, the way you put the plaster is very important, the way you fix the AV fistula, excessive sweating. Maybe some patients may have some allergy or some itching and they can uh, inadvertently remove the needle. And you know that most of the patients are not, they're not at all conscious. I see most of the patients are not bothered as they're very much happy. It is because of the trust they have in you, I guess, that they are not uh, aware of what complication can occur just by the needle uh, if it gets dislodged. So hemodialysis machines cannot be relied on to detect venous needle dislodgement because the decrease in venous pressure may be inadequate to activate the alarm due to the initial low venous pressure. Now we have this venous chamber. It allows us, uh, the venous chamber allows us for the separation of air bubbles. Also, it helps us to determine the pressure in this circuit. Now, the venous pressure depends not only on the this segment, but also as, as, as I was trying to say, the pressure in the AV fistula. And other factors are the blood flow, the viscosity. And also just imagine the height, the difference in height uh, between the AV fistula and the venous ch chamber also predicts the amount of pressure. So imagine it will never be zero. The intra-axis pressure will never be zero. So you may miss the alarm. So the, term, so the determinants of venous pressure are intra-axis pressure, the blood flow, the needle length, the gauge thickness, the blood viscosity. With narrow gauge needles and high blood flow, the relatively high flow resistance may prevent the venous pressure to fall low enough to set off the alarm. And lower limit of venous pressure alarms are usually set 30 to 40, you know, not even 30 to 40, some places only less than 20 below the axis pressure. So in the absence of blood flow, just uh, I wanted to stress on that the venous pressure reading is equal. If, they, if you just, uh, the blood pump is off and you connect the uh, AV fistula, you will get a reading. And that gives an approximate amount of the intra-axis pressure. And when the needle slips out from the axis, but remains at the same height, the venous pressure will be decreased just by the amount of the axis pressure. Now, what is wrong with all this? What if you miss? How much time do you have? Suppose you're setting the machine blood pump at 300 ml per minute and you miss it for 20 minutes. How much blood can you lose? You can lose six liters of blood. 
And if it's just two minutes, you can lose 0.6 or 600 ml, but that's enough for us, for the patient to go into shock. That's scary. So next time I want you to be aware of your needle and you properly fix the AV fistula needle. So cause is one, disruption of connection from the tubing to the needle. Other causes are like, there is low blood flow from the arterial slide. There is some dialysis clot, so there is decreased blood flow coming. If there is thinking here, all this will cause low venous pressure. Now, I just imagine the same patient, you had a call, you had that uh, alarm. See, look at this, the venous pressure is low, but still uh, the machine is going on. Green means the machine is still going on. Unless you are, you're vigilant, you know, yes, something can go wrong with this patient. Uh, you will not be, you will, even, the, even if the alarms are there, you may not be informed. You will not get the, uh, you will not know what is happening. So always look at the venous axis, see the needle is properly placed. Now you saw the venous axis and then you saw uh, the needle is in place. So you look for other conditions, which I said. So what I meant by talking to your patients is, you know, when you come, the pain, you know how much fluid he has taken. So you may set the ultrafiltration at a high level. You know uh, uh, whether he has taken any uh, blood pressure medicine, was he, has he taken food, does he have any infection, any cardiac event, all this can cause low blood pressure. So we must be aware of the condition that causes decreased blood flow. And while you're talking, while all this is happening, clinically be aware that the patient, even symptoms like yawning, nausea, vomiting, cramping, all this can be caused uh, because of hypotension. And the cold, clammy skin, altered mental state, uh, status, seizures, you know, and you are taking precautions like uh, putting the patient in Trendlenburg position. You may stop the ultrafiltration. You may give saline to try sodium modeling and look for the apparent cause. So next, what do we do? We must not let it happen again to this patient. Or the patient may not be. Uh, so uh, we must try to evaluate what is the target weight for this patient. We must set a new target weight. Evaluate how much fluid pool, I mean, next time, make a note of it so that your colleague will know next time when the person comes, such a thing will not happen again. And most importantly, we, this is very important. We must inform the doctor regarding the blood pressure medicines. Is this okay? Should the patient continue with the same medications or should the patient be, should it be changed? Now, what is this? This is showing elevated venous pressure and automatically the TMP has come down. Whenever there is uh, elevation in the venous pressure, this will also be reflected in the TMP. What is the role for transmembrane pressure? It is showing the difference in the pressure in the blood circuit and the dialysate compartment. So essentially, if we set an ultrafiltration, you want to remove a lot of fluid. That For that, we use the TMP helps us to understand how much fluid to be removed. And those, this goes hand in hand. So now the venous pressure has come. The message, just imagine it's given in the, it comes in the machine itself. The venous, if you don't understand what has happened, you can just put a question mark, help, and you're getting venous pressure upper limit. So what has happened? Yes, it is giving check, uh, check if the needle is correctly positioned. Blood flow, is it too high? Check the tubes and you have to new, set new settings. So what are the causes for high venous pressure alarm? Just imagine if there is a kink here somewhere, the tubes are not properly placed. If there is a clot in the chamber and just imagine there is a, some obstruction, some stenosis, we have some infiltration or something is uh, happening here. So venous axis malfunction. All this can cause increase in the venous pressure alarm. So you have to inform your doctor or whoever is in charge that uh, you are, uh, who is the senior person that this patient had come and you're getting a high venous pressure alarm maybe. And if the patient has uh, not doing too well, that he has not been feeling well since the last two, three dialysis, you must think there is something wrong with the AV fistula. Maybe something has to be done for that. So a question. Mr. X was uh, 50, 50 years uh, on uh, dialysis for the past seven years through the AV fistula. His blood flow is 250 ml per minute. During dialysis, he develops pain at the venous needle site. So what is happening? What do you think you'll get 
as I said now, the call, what you'll get is high venous pressure alarm. So you have to inform your doctor. The transmembrane pressure uh, is set, uh, is come, alarms come when there is fluctuations in the ultrafiltration goal. And essentially, transmembrane uh, pressure helps us to diagnose if there is clotting of the dialyzer. Any, uh, during the dialysis, you may have set an ultra high ultrafiltration and towards the uh, end, there may be some protein coating also some, or the um, uh, dialysis you may have to change because of multiple reuse. And sometimes you are trying to remove the fluid in the last half an hour, uh, trying to remove excess fluid. So whenever there is a mismatch between the blood pump speed and the ultrafiltration rate, the transmembrane pressure alarm can occur. So what you can do is you have to reset it and everything and the alarm will go. Now, another complication that can occur is blood leak detector. Mind you, the, this, all these things, complications were once upon a time very common, but now we have good dialyzer. The dialyzer membrane, uh, like polysulfone, is able to withstand pressure. So you don't see this commonly, but if you have not properly uh, the, for reuse, if, you're, if you have used uh, whatever chemical you use, depending on that, can cause damage to the membrane. But remember, if you have done, if you have a good machine and you've seen the previous dialyzer was okay, if you know what is the fiber bundle volume, if there's no leakage, you can, you know, all those things will not happen, but you are, you are supposed to be aware of the fact that the dialyzer can, uh, they're fragile and they can rupture and you can lose blood. The problem is loss of blood and because the membrane rupture, the blood and the dialysate are coming in contact and the dialysate is not sterile. So we have blood leak detectors in the dialysis machine. It activates the alarm when you are losing a blood as small as 0 0.25 to 0 0.35 ml per minute. And this is by a certain a light, a light when the blood goes through it, I'll show you. Uh, it can detect if it is, has been cleared. Uh, actually, it, it is it's supposed to be water. If there is some impurity, it will detect it. The light will not reach the other side, the other photoelectric cell. So what will happen? A signal will be transmitted seeing that something has been, blood has been detected. But remember, it's not just this alarm can occur, not just because of the dialysate membrane rupture. Sometimes even in conditions like free uh, severe hemolysis, Heme can cause the, or any impurities. And you must also be aware of the fact that there are false alarms. False alarms because of air. air or, you, or your blood detector is not dirty or not properly maintained. It. So all this can cause false alarm. And also sometimes the blood leak detector can also itself may not be working properly. So what is happening is you're having a beam of light. Normally when the effluent is clean, it is clear, the light, the, the, light, the alarms are off. But if it, there is blood, the light will not reach and the alarm will be, uh, there will be an alert because of the alarm. So how do we, what do we do? That's it. We can have, initially we can have a look at the effluent. Does it look like there is blood? But you can confirm, sometimes you can confirm by doing the benzene test. You have a strip, you can check for blood in it. So now you know, okay, you have detected blood. Now the filter has ruptured and you know you cannot, it may, may need to be replaced. What happens? You can maybe afford to, maybe the dialysis uh, procedure is going to be over within half an hour, one hour. Maybe you can wait and see. Sometimes if it's a small rupture, the blood itself can come and clog and then uh, the, the no more bleeding or no more loss of blood will occur. But remember, we have to discard the dialyzer. Sometimes we have seen uh, a certain batch or group of uh, dialysis which we buy. Suddenly all three, four, five, six are not. Uh, they're always showing blood leak. So you should inform whoever has uh, supplied you that the dialyzer is not good. We may have to change it. Now the next alarm is the air detector alarm. Always, always be aware of this. It goes, uh, it is, it goes undetected. Maybe what will happen is it may be just small air bubbles. 
and it may be just uh, along the way. If you see most of them, the, the technicians are not too worried about it when they see this. But uh, you must know that all these air bubbles can go undetected. It has happened that patients can develop air embolism. Maybe I will just talk about it. So well, how do you detect, how is the air bubble, uh, air bubble detected? So what is happening? Water or blood can transmit uh, ultrasonic uh, waves. But if an air comes, it will not normally contact. So this is because of ultrasonic waves that we are able to detect. So how do you get air in the circuit? Air, something has the blood pump, something has, uh, as I told you, the dialysis, something has caused rupture to the tubings or the uh, tubing. This is supposed to be tubing. Uh, arterial circuit is detached. There's clamp between the infusion port and infusion set is not clamped properly. Um, arterial flow, flow is poor. And by a lot of suction, you may be pulling a lot of air and slowly small, small air bubbles collect. And a proper and tight connection is not done. And most importantly, proper priming was not done. That is something that has to be looked into whether you have done a proper priming of the dialyzer. And you, you can remove the air. What you can do is initially make sure it is not a, a false alarm. That you clean the uh, place and suddenly if you uh, look that uh, it may be a small alarm, maybe if you change the position of the drip chamber, it may that air may not be detected and it will work. And you can clean the sensors and see if it's uh, uh, the alarms are going off or not. But what will happen is if you see air in the dialyzer, you are seeing a lot of air, you can disconnect the circuits from the patient and put it into recirculation. And what will happen is you can give a saline infusion and see if you're able to remove the air. If not, you may have to discard it. And if you're seeing that there is air throughout the dialyzer and tubings, it is better to discard it. So this is just to show you. Very, the, this was a case that was given uh, cited in the net that I've seen that a patient after undergoing dialysis, the next day he comes with uh, some altered sensorium, and when they have done the CT scan, it, uh, they have found that there was air in the. Uh, uh, air was there detected. So it showed gas in the cerebral venous circulation. So the obvious cause would have been the air embolism. So a late presentation is also can occur. Maybe we had been missing out. So how does it present air embolism? The patient may be in sitting position. It may go through the venous uh, circulation, go to the cerebral uh, circulation itself. Or if the patient is lying down, it can go to the heart and uh, a, a block causing cardiac reduced output and hypotension. Patient can go into sudden cardiac arrest. It may be micro, uh, the air embolism can occur to the pulmonary vasculature if it's on the right side and can cause breathlessness, acute respiratory failure. And all this can cause sudden death. Or some patients, they may have some clots along with the air. And some patients may have an open, there's something called the patent foramen ovale, where the left atrium and the right atrium may be connected. So some gas collection in the right atrium can go to the left atrium. And from there, just imagine the, the emboli air can reach the brain. And you may find the patient has come with some stroke. And you'll, uh, you may not think of a condition like air embolism. So all those things are small, uh, maybe rare things, but it is it is possible. So if you find that you have detected air, you will, of course, the machine will automatically stop, but you have put the position in the left Trendelenburg position, you give oxygen, high flow ox uh, oxygen, uh, maybe even mechanically in intubate the patient, sometimes even may have to aspirate, uh, or even if available, hyperbaric oxygen also help this will also remove the air. So how do you do now what we need is prevention. You must always make sure you are priming the dialyzer properly, priming the dialyzer and tubing. Avoid extremely high uh, blood flow. Keep the, all the locks properly tightened. Maintain, sometimes maintaining the venous uh, pressure chamber also will uh, prevent the air to collect. 
So with all this, we said the alarms that uh, was there. So I have finished with the alarms that can be seen. So the alarms is uh, arterial pressure alarm, venous pressure alarm, the transmembrane pressure alarm, then the blood leak alarm and the air detector alarm. So as a part of, I, I thought I must mention this, as a part of the complication of all this is hemolysis. We are seeing the blood, the blood is, uh, the blood tubing and the color of the blood. We must always be aware of what is happening. So what is hemolysis is the rupture of the red blood cells. Now, you must know in conditions of uremia itself, the RBCs are prone for rupture. And it is, uh, in, uh, it can be hemolysis rupture of this uh, hemolysis will lead to complications like a patient may present with nausea, vomiting, chest pain, breathlessness, they may have abdominal pain <clears throat> and also uh, because of the low hemoglobin, all this because of low hemoglobin and the rupture of the membranes can cause hyper hyperkalemia release of potassium from the RBCs and that can eventually lead to death. So this is a picture showing the crenated RBCs. So how does hemolysis occur? If you see excess negative pressure applied on the arterial side or if you have low conductivity, if the temperature is increased, if there has been occlusion of the pump, so all this can lead to hemolysis of the hemolysis can lead to hemolysis so whenever you see the patient you are you are aware of uh, you are also seeing the blood circuit you are seeing air of foam what all will you be uh, conscious of look for air or foam in the blood lines look for any uh, whether the needle is in place whether the patient's av fistula needle is in place Look at the color. If there is cherry red blood, that means it indicates that has the red cells have ruptured. Hemolysis has occurred. If there is dark blood, you must be aware it may be uh, concentrated. There is or uh, the there is some clotting tendency. So just by having a vis visual uh, this thing, you know actually what is happening with the patient. So that is uh, has been my talk on. Alarms. Now, complications. We know now this is just uh, uh, as a part of my, I'm going to end with two or three slides. Uh, we know there are so many complications that can occur to, during hemodialysis. And because most of the patients on maintenance hemodialysis, they are stable. Uh, what I find is the newer generation are not, uh, maybe it is uh, the generation gap, but whether uh, I feel um, some of them are not, because they don't see the complication. We have seen so many complications that has occurred. Now I know there are so many centers uh, all over Kerala and most of you are on your own and you may not be immediate, you may not have a doctor immediately with you for your help. Uh, so do not take whatever you're doing, do not take it lightly. Uh, the patient who comes to you can develop any complication at any minute is something that should you should be aware of. We see um, it's not just, uh, um, I'm not trying to find any fault with anyone, but if you see in the medical uh, field now, it is the medication errors that are cause, that has been one of the commonest cause for death of patients in the hospital. And uh, medication errors, errors can happen with anyone, of course. <clears throat> we are humans, we can make errors. But uh, can, uh, can we afford to make such gross errors is what you should be aware of because it is it costs a life of a person. Now, once upon a time, we had trouble. We had to calculate the, uh, find out the TMP as to set the ultrafiltration goal and uh, decide... Uh, ultrafiltration and calculate the TMP as to remove the fluid. So all this thing is not required. It is like comparing the old phone and the latest smartphone. You can do dialysis even from far because the machines are so lighted up. But remember, it is not uh, safe. It's not completely safe. Fails, don't feel, feel safe about it. 
Now, what has happened? COVID has taught us so many lessons and something new has also come up. Now we have even remote control. Uh, you, by, you don't have to sit near the patient with remote control. You can control the dialysis machine. So that's how things are going. But we are humans. We should be aware of what are the complications. And so, so many errors can occur in the unit or medication error. Most important is we must give, follow a protocol as how you've been taught. You must follow it through and through. Do not miss any step. Uh, lab related, blood bank, how when you give blood, all these are small things, but it is very important. The procedure, how you conduct the procedure is very important. How you maintain, how you keep the needle is very important. How you maintain the machine, your monitor is very important. And understand the patient's condition all the time. Always try to communicate with your patient. Otherwise, the consequence is that. So with this, I wish to end my talk.